So in this next video and flowchart, we're going to be looking at the ecosystem productivity in a bit more detail. We're going to entitle the next flowchart Ecosystem Productivity 2. And here we're going to continue our look on this idea of the ecosystem and the idea of energy flows within it, specifically focusing on the trophic levels that we see. Previously, we established the idea that at the first trophic level, we have this GPP, this gross primary production, and then this NPP, net primary production, that other organisms can consume, specifically those primary consumers. This idea lays itself to this overarching theme of the following. We have to understand that at each trophic level, and this is a rule that we've actually established prior in our, in our uh, population ecology and our community ecology lectures, that at each trophic uh, level, less energy is available than the level before. Less energy is available versus or then the level prior. What we mean by this is the following. If we go d down or up a trophic level, whatever you want to call it, uh, we have to understand that we're going to get less and less energy. Specifically, if I imagine the first trophic level, I will see the following. Producers will capture energy, and that specifically is, of course, referring to the energy from the sun. So we'll write producers capture energy. That's their job to produce. Some energy is going to be lost, and some will be kept. Some energy lost, some remains. Remember this idea of utilizing it for your own respiration and some of it being utilized within the tissues as storage. So that's the idea that we see here. Producers capture energy, some energy lost, and some energy remains. Now we can move forward by stating that in the next trophic level, let's say the second trophic level, we'll have the following scenario. In the second trophic level, we are trying to capture that net primary production, that remaining tissue energy. We're trying to capture that NPP from those producers of our first trophic level. And if we can do that, we have consumed what we needed. We have consumed energy. In addition, from this capturing process, we hope to incorporate some of this energy into our own tissues incorporate some into tissues, some energy into own tissues. But what's also going is going to happen is that some though will be incorporated and some of it will actually be lost. So we'll say um, lose some energy as both cellular respiration processes and also the idea of defecation or feces, both of which will promote the, the losing of some energy, whereas the incorporation of some energy will be within the own tissues. So this is our primary consumer, let's say. They're going to consume plants, they're going to store some energy and lose some energy in cellular respiration and feces. Moving forward, we're going to now jump up to the next trophic level. Notice how we're losing and we're losing. We're constantly losing as we move up these trophic levels. In the third trophic level, we can state the following. We're going to now try to capture the initial net primary production from not the first level because that's already been captured, but actually from the second trophic level because the second trophic level has incorporated some energy into its own tissues. That's what we as the third trophic level will try to obtain. We're trying to obtain that incorporation. And then, of course, because this is how energy flows in this linear format, we're going to always have to make sure that we actually do, of course, lose some energy. And that energy will be lost, of course, as, just like before, cell respiration and feces. Our, our waste products, essentially, will always have energy within them, and they will be lost. This losing of energy in each and every level is going to be an important concept to understand in this ecosystem productivity idea. And we have to just remember that overall energy loss is a key factor. It's an absolutely crucial driving factor. Energy loss is key factor.
that actually limits number of trophic levels. That limits number of trophic levels. Why are the trophic levels limited? Why don't we have 20 trophic levels? Well, that's because you lose energy. You lose some more energy. You keep on losing energy as you go through these trophic levels. More and more energy is being lost, less and less energy is being maintained, and thus you have this loss of energy. Again, remember, this is from that energetic hypothesis that we established in our previous lecture. And that is that hypothesis showing itself up in great detail at the ecosystem level in this downward form of energy. Finally, what we also have to understand is that we can apply this idea of trophic levels and ecosystem productivity to real-life ecosystems. Specifically, let's first look at what I would consider primary production, so that initial idea from our first flowchart of primary production, but specifically we're going to put it in a time and place in aquatic environments. How do the aquatic environments work and how do, later on we'll see, the terrestrial environments work? So in aquatic environments. So let's see. Here we have a bit of a limitation and our major limitation here is light. Light has a difficult time uh, uh, propagating itself in an aquatic environment. Specifically, we have to focus on the idea of the depth of light penetration. How far down can light actually go when water is its medium? And specifically, we have to understand that this depth of light penetration directly is going to affect somebody. Who cares about light the most? That is going to be most affected. That is going to be, of course, the primary producers. It affects primary producers and primary production in what we call photic zones. Those are going to be the zones where light enters water. Photic zone is simply a zone in which light enters water. If you are very deep in the water, your photic zone will be very minimal, and thus the primary producers within that photic zone will have difficulty converting that energy into a more usable cell energy form. Finally, in terms of light limitation, we know that about 50% of light absorbed is only going to be available to the first 15 meters of the water depth, let's say. Absorbed um, in first 15 meters. So these first 15 meters of this light, of this uh, aquatic environment, are critical. These are the ones that are going to get the most energy because they're going to get the most light and thus they're going to have the most NPP for the each trophic level to work off of. So that's a big limitation within an aquatic environment, this idea of light penetration. In addition, there's not only light limitation, but there's also going to be a nutrient limitation in this environment as well. So because there's a light limitation, we have to look at the nutrient limitation. Nutrient limitations are always the most important factor in whenever studying any ecosystem productivity. What is the major nutrient limitation? That will give you a lot of information about everything you need to know in terms of the ecosystem productivity. Usually we can actually bring it down and all the way down to the limiting nutrient itself. What is the critical nutrient that is needed in this environment, in this aquatic environment specifically? This is going to be defined as the element that absolutely must, absolutely must be added, it must be available and added, whatever you want to call it, for those critical primary producers, must be added for primary producers to increase. For them to increase would mean that the NPP increases, and if the NPP increases at this level, then it will increase at the following level, and so forth. So it's a very critical limiting nutrient that's there. In a marine ecosystem, and in marine ecosystems in general, this limiting nutrient is usually nitrogen and phosphorus. These are both our LN, limiting nutrients. Finally, we're going to complete this idea of ecosystem productivity by looking not at the aquatic environments, but we're going to transfer ourselves onto land, look at these trophic levels on land, and notice the primary production in no longer aquatic environments, but specifically in what we call terrestrial environments, aka environments on land. So. When we look at a terrestrial environment or an ecosystem, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, we're going to be specifically focusing on major factors such as temperature and moisture will always play a big, big role. 
Temperature and moisture are key, let's say. What was key in an aquatic ecosystem or environment? The light, and specifically the depth of the light penetration. Temperature and moisture, aka the availability of water, and the temperature at which the water or the environment is in, it's going to be critical. There's also going to be a nutrient limitation in this ecosystem. Uh, let's write this down. Nutrient limitation. Our nutrient limitation is still actually nitrogen and phosphorus. These are critical, important compounds, important elements that must be added for our primary producers to actually increase. And if they are not there, our primary producers will suffer and thus the entire system will suffer. A good example of this is the following. In a terrestrial environment, we've noticed that organisms have actually adapted themselves so well through millions of years of evolution to actually increase the two critical nutrient limitations to increase both N plus P production. Again, nitrogen and phosphorus production. If you can increase this production, you can increase NPP and you have an entire productivity system that's going to increase as a whole. The greatest example of this, something that we're actually going to be looking at in Bio 2 as well when we study fungi, is mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae are an example of a critical, critical, critical fungi within environments that's going to play this role of increasing nitrogen and phosphorus production. Mycorrhizae are usually going to be found as fungi and also fungi located directly on plant roots. And when we see these mycorrhizae, the, th this is going to literally going to allow us uh, to have the plant roots increase a critical part, something that all of biology follows this rule of surface area. If you can increase your surface area as a plant root, that would mean that you can increase your uh, consumption, your ability to get more nutrients. So thus you get more nutrients. And so we see through this ecosystem productivity section the trophic levels that follow, the NPP that follows, the energy that continuously is reduced that limits the number of trophic levels that we see. And we've applied that to both aquatic environments or we can even say ecosystems here. And we also did that for terrestrial environments or ecosystems in other words through this idea of nutrient limitations.